So that was ready in 1837. And as far as we know, we've got a single horse with other set of tickets that has been used for everything but. From wedding receptions to the finest boxing gym in Scotland to a joiner's yard, which is close to the museum. And then, and the reason for all this washing on the road over means it gets it out of the way before we get here. In 1840, we start work here on the mausoleum. Now, if you look back across the way where the sports grounds are, you'll see the big circus tent, the big covered pitch that's over there. Well, that is where the collegiate church would have stood. The collegiate church had been Hamilton's original church, built in the mid-1500s with permission from the Pope, and then like a lot of churches around here, it changed sides and became the local parish church, and remained that until the mid-1730s, until what we now know as the old parish church up in Castle Street, was the brand new parish church. And I'll just get this gate open, let us in. So you get to Alexander's time, and there's only about half of it still standing. Half of it is still there, half of it is still there. The burial aisle is still intact, just as well. But that's where the ancestors are still residing, going right back to the first Earl of Cadso, given these lands by Robert the Bruce himself. Alexander took one look at those ruins and went, oh no. You know who you know? Look at me on that. He wanted something as befitting the stature of the Douglas Hamilton family. So this is one man making a statement about the sale to the family. So it's not just a pure vanity project on his part. A lot of it is, but it's also for the family too. And he had very set ideas about what he wanted. He wanted a Roman and white temple with various other three classic churches incorporated into it. So David Hamilton was originally given the commission. And Alexander actually drew out his sketches about what he wanted. David Hamilton drew the two old sketches coming out the top of the when he started work on the in 1840. Unfortunately, he died just two years in the So David Bryce, the Gordon Bryce architects in Edinburgh, took over the project and stopped through to the Now, there is a lot so, the story goes, that covers all bases. Every we tell that we have the truth for a minute, just over the last 160 years of just gathered peace and arms and legs, we're not actually quite sure how long it took to build this place. Some sources say it was finished in 1856, some say as late as 1858. David Bryce's accounts from the one time was squared up until 1860. So we're looking at 20 years this project here. What we do know, this huge building, there's just two rooms. There's the crypt and the chapel. And the crypt was ready to take in borders as it were in August of 1852. So with due pomp and ceremony, Alexander saw his ancestors in the lovely new coffin, brought across the Cathedral Church, brought along to here. It's over here, there's nothing to hold in it, but it's hard to hold. Now, of course, coal would play a major part in the story of all of this. When you get into the late Victorian era, uh, late 1800s, early 1800s, in Hamilton alone, the Hamilton Parish alone, there were 22 coal mines up and running. So if you look at Mark of Hamilton in 1895, for instance, you see through the cloud stops and train station. And from the train station up, there's nothing. So it's the hill who's still in the hill, Fair Hill, Barncliff, right through, Beaverley, and all that. That doesn't exist. It's just coal mines that are there. 
the Coleman's own family there, Coleman's and Mark Paul, Coleman's in the other place there. <coughs> Cole was the main money earner for the family at that time, and they owed the two Coleman's. Now, uh, William, the 12th Duke, Alexander's grandson, the gambler, the playboy, the racehorse owner. They owed the one small line down in Dursair from the place side, but the big money earner for the family is across the way there. Because what should be standing where MDs, the theme park and all that is, where Star Fred Lock is, what should be standing there, and it's quite funny, is the town of Bothell Hall. And dominating Bothell Hall was the palace, the palace pit. So that's what should be over there, a whole town, and this huge big coal mine dominating it. MDs actually stands on Bothell Hall Road. I mean, you come out the main gate and go across the road into the park and you actually come across all the halls. War Memorial is still standing there. So basically, along that road, you get to the roundabout and the road that takes you up to Orbison. That's where Bob Hall should have been. I mean, there's its own railway station, major railway line running into it. The pit closed down in 1957. When the pit closed down, basically, so did the town. Within 10 years, there's only a few families left over there. Hamilton Town Council cleared them out. But at that time, recently, four started to cut across the parks. And then just cleared it all. So what we do know is Strathclyde, Strathclyde Park and the lock, the water sports centre, and all that really kicked in the 70s. That was all created over there. Coal would go for 12 shillings and 6 pence a tonne, 62 and a half pence per tonne, depending on which source you read, the cup for the family was between 6 pence and 2 and 6 back in every tonne of coal quarried on the low parts here. That was the other cut. The low parts, the fair game, all right here for, for mine and under, but for obvious reasons. 150 yard exclusion zone around the mausoleum, same with the palace, 150 yards around the palace, that they weren't allowed to quarry under, for obvious reasons. Now, when William died in 1895, died on holiday in Algiers, he was the last Hamilton laid to rest within these walls. When he died, he left two major problems behind him. One, the dead. The huge debt that he inherited from his grandfather's extravagances. If you want a final price tag on this building, it was thirty thousand pounds, which is probably the equivalent of very good between three and thirty million in today's money. Probably around three million pounds that sort of thing. And then the money for his palace and the money for his Just watch out your edge here, this should be right. Summer of 1921, when the decision was made to remove the bodies, 
So often these lava were taken across the sea, not to sky, but to the Isle of Arm. And if you go to the road to Broadhead Castle, Oh, it's some echo. sections pit together each door weighs three quarters of a ton but was so beautifully balanced when they were hung once she turned the key to lock she used a pinky to push them open and again 
again, a wee push with the pinky. And when these doors slam shut, with the weight of them and the bronze are resonating with the echo, longer than the wooden doors are in place now, that's how this place had a 30 second echo, and he's in so many record books, it's the longest echo of any building in the world. The doors were taken down in 1921 22 for the same reason the bodies were removed. With the building moving and shifting, the fear was they were going to get damaged as the door was going offline and beyond repair. But this one's actually got a wee stress fracture here on the side where the weight was coming down on it. This was just a temporary move, and then once they realised the building wasn't going to fall down, or safe enough. This is what you would have seen coming up the stairs. This is the front of the doors. The other side of the doors are just the impressions of the molds. So, we have Joseph and the Corn Exchange in the top panel. We have the Ark of the Covenant in the middle panel. It's showing the power of the Ark and why Indiana Jones had to rescue it from the Nazis. There we are. Because the trumpets are blaring that indeed is the city of Jericho and the walls are coming down. And this is King Solomon in the court of the Queen of Sheba. Now, unfortunately, these doors weren't ready until 1856, four years after Alexander died, so he never asked us for his doors. But Mill made sure he was paid. These doors cost £1,500, brand new. So again, put your zeros on the end of that now to see how much these doors There's no chance to be rehung now, because this is happening. They wouldn't last ten minutes out there. <laughs> Now, I'm sure you've noticed, one chap down here has a very shiny hand. Looking for an old health and guidebook. Back in the late 1800s, the low parts were open to the public on a Tuesday and a Friday. So you could dress in your finest, come down, come through the gates, wander amongst the gardens in the estate, do a tour of various buildings. You could have done a tour of the mausoleum with the bodies in it, but I didn't want you to. Say hello to everybody. We don't know who had the first rush of blood to the head, but one day somebody came past the last wheel, ran up those stairs, and shook his hands. What are you doing that for? Oh, it's for good luck. And it must have worked. The Victorian lottery number was to come up that night. And it became tradition when doors in place, all the doors in here, to come up and shake his hand. So that's 150 odd years worth of the acid off of people's fingertips. Polishing his hand and sleeve up, which is why he's got his gold hand. Well, it looks like he's got a gold hand. The other story that we hear if a young lady was desperate for a son, she wanted a baby boy, she'd come up and pat the head of the wee boy in the corner. Now, did anybody have a wee contact mirror on them? Right, we just need to make do with feel these nose. Because what you would do is you'd put a mirror down there in front of this chap, shine the torch there. You would see his face looking back at you, such as the detail throughout right these doors. But if you go up the slope and down the other side, David and Goliath. If David felled the great giant as he slung his pebbles, used to bring him down, then you make your way up through the bloodshed and the carnage of the battle of the Philistines. There they are taking Goliath's head back in triumph to Jerusalem. And if I go over here, I've got a picture. There is the fantastic sight, the doors would have been in place. A wee dapper looking Victorian gentleman, giving it some scale. Not as good as old William Beckford, door. In his place, Fon Hill Abbey, his big folly that he built up. He had 38 foot tall doors, and he actually employed a dwarf to stand in front of them to make them look even taller. <laughs> Our boy wasn't that demented. <laughs> but uh, I think it's been, I've been such a good family friend, it's going to be enough to get some of his ideas from him. Right, speaking of the man himself, there he is. 
in his full ill magnificence. When you walked into the palace, into the hallway, you were greeted with a life-sized version of this painting of Alexander, posing like a hardy on the shop red tin sort of thing. And then you would turn the corner, go down a corner, and there was a life-size painting of Napoleon Bonaparte facing you. He was a great admirer of the Bonapartes, so much so that while his son, William, was in love with Duffel and wanted to marry her, Alexander told the son, he said, no, you know, son, you're marrying Princess Marie of Baden. Why, Dad? Because then we've got a direct blood link with the Bonaparte family. There we go. Spy the wife. There is Susan Bedford, the Duchess. At her piano, she was a concert pianist who was good for cycles over at the palace and was invited various composers and performers of the day. The most high profile, the great Friday Chopin, stayed for a few nights in Hamilton and gave a couple of recitals. I went back home to Poland and told everybody the Hamiltons were the maddest, craziest people you'd ever met. Every single one of them was a screw loose. <laughs> now, we do get asked, is he still in here? the black marble plinth, upon which sat the Egyptian sarcophagus our boy was laid to rest in. One of two that he had, his other ones in the Kelvin Grove. Oh, I thought I'd seen that before. Mm -hmm. But this one was acquired due to a wee deal with the British Museum going awry. In the mid-1830s, the British Museum thought they were buying a proper royal Egyptian sarcophagus. £632, eight shillings and sixpence of taxpayers' money was used to buy it. Guess who was the most trusted trustee who did the deal? Alexander. Unfortunately, when the great crate arrived in the museum and they opened it up, they found they had been sold a ringer. It was a genuine sarcophagus from 600 BC. It wasn't a royal one. But with the various copies of transcripts of the letters with the finger pointing, out comes the classic quote among them about the Duke being humbugged by those rascally Frenchmen. It's like bought in Paris. Fire that, or the old boy knew exactly what he was up to all along. Because 632 pounds, eight shillings, and sixpence of Hamilton money found its way to the British Museum. The British Museum could refund the treasury. Everybody's happy. That casket is now in 12 Portland Square, the Duke's apartment. Which must have been a great talking piece when you walked into his flat. Well, I've got done with a flat in the grey. Still stack off it. And we sold the dinner. But he did the same day as befitting the old magnificent old magnificent casket on the whole of the rest of it. And doing a great study in Egypt of Egyptology. So he did try to get some things to make sure he tried to get everything wrong. But when he died, he stepped in the casket and brought it to him. As I say, that plinth is in place. But the floor still had to be laid, the dome still had to be completed, but he still did the service in here. Full ceremony, full regalia. Unfortunately, before the game, there was a lot of what to do because that casket was six feet long, custom made for a woman of five foot six. And he stood six foot two. And it was, he had shut down a couple of inches, but he was about six foot. Now his body was prepared in the proper Egyptian way. There are three variations of the Hindu Gautama. Before they could do anything, the stonemasons working the building hauled out the stone as much as they could without destroying some things that's lovely green porphyry. Story number one. A wee twist, he's a wee jump in the middle of One side of that's on top of he's not coming back out. And he is quoted in a couple of books in the famous last words where are you? Double me up, double me up. Hey, talk, Kayla. Say it again. That's amazing. <laughs> do, keep doing, because the camera will pick it up. Right, wait a minute, she's, you're over there, which is right the way around to here. Right, Kayla, speak. Speak! Talk. Say something. You're rubbish. Count to ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's amazing. Isn't it? Cold. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. 
You feel the draft? That's where the draft's coming from. Feel that? That is freezing. It's coming from in there. Basically, what you've got is you've got the basic notes, you've got the hit list, and I'll just explain this wee drawing as well. That is the survey that was done in the 1970s. So, this is where they think I'm making all this up. That's the five coal seams, the 200 metres down. Right. There's the cottage, 2.9, 3.5 metres. That's the wee one that's feet, over there yep. next to the toilet, uh -huh. kind of used to be the old toilet. And 5.4, 5.6 metres, or 18 feet for the mausoleum. You also found there's a fault line runs across Strathclyde Park. So if you ever think there's an earthquake taking place down here, uh -huh. it's happening at Strathclyde Park because the fault line runs across it. God almighty. So is that how deep this is? Down 200 metres, eh? From that? Mm -hmm. Jeez, oh. Which is why when they built Asda over there, they had to spend two weeks just filling the ground and underneath it just to give it a solid enough base. A uh, solid base. Or else they cut the ribbon and seen Asda disappearing down a main shaft. Uh -huh. <laughs> Stand in the middle. It's stand in the middle. That's an echo now, I think. Right, shout, just shout once. Shout hello. Hello. <laughs> what? Cool, isn't it? It's quite the place. 